Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it good when we bring babies and we have dedications? I remember in the early years of this church, dedications were few and far between because we didn't have that many people that, that were having children. But, but now we have a dedication or two almost every month. Isn't it something to rejoice at? A amen. Amen. And having said that, now I come to my confession. Amen. From time to time, I need a pick-me-up, something to boost my faith. You see, you can't be in this walk and not need encouragement from time to time um, and not need, I call it, an elixir. And I checked what an elixir is in the dictionary. It's a magical medicine. Okay? Or a tonic. A tonic strengthens you. So I call my message today elixir and tonic. See, because I, I realize that one of the greatest things that can pick us up is when we come to study testimonies. Amen? When, when we go through Scripture and we see men and women like ourselves going through experiences like we are going through, feeling just how we feel, and yet we see how God brings them through. And, and that if God could bring them through, how much more bring us through who in many ways are under a new and better covenant than they were. Amen? So I'm just going to, I, I want to encourage somebody in the house today. Somebody who feels, I need a pick-me-up. This walk of faith ain't easy. Is there somebody like that in the house today? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, so I, I want to start with good old Abraham. Abraham. The Lord said unto Abraham, I'm reading Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land which I will show thee. What God was doing was taking Abraham out of a spirit place of stability. Abraham had stability in being surrounded by family, by friends. So God was taking him out of a place where he had reasonable expectations for the future and taking him into a place where he couldn't really tell what tomorrow would bring. Is anybody there right now where you wake up in the morning and you really don't have a clue how the day will go? Some people get into that situation. But, but God doesn't take you out of a situation without a promise. And here's what God said to Abraham. He said, And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Tell somebody, God bless you so you can be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So at the age of 75, God takes Abraham out of a stable setting and takes him into a place that all he has is a word from God, that I will show you where you're going. I will make you a great nation. And the one thing about Abraham is I didn't see endless questions. He didn't ask God why, how. You know what Abraham did? He just did what God said. And here is what God says 
about Abraham in the end. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. That, I pray, will be what God will say about you. Whatever you are in right now, whatever you are facing right now, at the end of the day, if you remain steadfast, if you continue to do what God asks you to do, God will bless you, you he will satisfy you with long life, and you will be blessed in all things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then I look at Noah. Noah lived in times that are similar to the times we live in. The people around Noah were gay. LGBT is not new. They were gay, they were partying, there was corruption, and all these things grieved Noah's heart. And then one day God called Noah and gave him directions. He said, Noah, begin to build. And, and recently, if you go onto the internet and I don't know what you check, whether you just put in Noah's Ark, there's a, there's a group of people I think it's Texas, Atlanta, okay, have replicated the ark which Noah built. It, was it two football fields? It's huge. It's huge. Now, God asked Moses to build a boat when there was no rain, when there was no flood. He asked him to, to build a boat when there was no need for a boat. And Noah began to build the boat. It took him 50 years to build this boat. And during the time he was building the boat, he faced mockery from the people. The people could not understand what he was doing. And the truth is that neither could Noah. But God said, build, and he began to build. This is what God said to Noah. The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without. At the end of the day, every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Has God put in your heart to do something that seems impossible? If God has given you something easy to do, then I wonder if it's really God. Because when God gives us tasks, they are tasks that are beyond our ability so that we tap into his ability. Amen? If he has, you can. If you're here this morning, just like Noah, God has committed something into your hands. He is well able to bring it to perfection. He doesn't start anything unless he can finish it. And this applies to the businesses you may have started. You may have started a business and you're looking around you and saying the economy is bad. It's not going to work. Well, I'm telling you that if God is behind your business, if God started it, it will work. Amen? It will work. Let's look at Moses. Moses was born under a death sentence. 
All Hebrew children, all Hebrew boys were meant to be killed at birth. So he was born under a death sentence. But here's what God did. And the child grew. And she brought him into, unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Moses was a great man in the making. God had a purpose for Moses' life. But if you looked at his beginnings, you would not be able to fathom how, how what God had planned for Moses could ever come to pass. You look at your sons, you look at your daughters, and you wonder how, in the midst of what we face in our nation, they will be able to thrive and prosper. It's in God's hands. He who has begun this good work will surely bring it to pass. The Moses that was born in the bulrushes, the Moses that was brought up in Pharaoh's house, taught by magicians, here is what he did. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry, and the waters were divided. What am I saying? When we study Moses, we recognize that nothing is impossible with those who believe God. And so today, if your faith has been shaking, remember Moses. As you remember Noah and Abraham, remember that this God we serve, he is more than able. Joshua understudied Moses. He learned from Moses. And one day, when Moses was dead, God came to Joshua and said, Joshua, my servant is dead. Now it's your time. Arise. You are going to lead the people of Israel from now on. And Joshua took a look at himself and said, I'm, I'm not able. I, I don't have the capacity God said, every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given it unto you, as I said to Moses. And I say to you here today, God is more than able to deliver you into your place of promise. Here is one of the instructions he gave to Joshua. He said, yet there shall be space between you and it. He's telling him, them how to follow the ark and cross the Jordan. That you may know that the way which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Some of you are going through experiences, through places you haven't been before. And they can be disconcerting. In the midst of the fact that you can't understand everything that's going on. I am there. I am with you. And when they went over Jordan and came in unto Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gigashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I don't know where the Jebus came from. And I delivered them into your hand. He was reminding Joshua all that he had done for him. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. 
And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's Joshua's testimony. Joshua was one of the 12 spies. But he was one of the two that came back with a good report. His report did not say there is not difficulty, there are not challenges in the land. He came back to say, yes, there are challenges in the land. But God, who is with us, is more than able. The other 10 came back to say, we saw the men in the land, they were like giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Grasshoppers mentality does not belong in the church of Jesus Christ. You are more than conquerors. Amen? You are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. I look at the story of Gideon. Gideon had this salutation from an angel. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee, you mighty man of valor. And at this moment, Gideon had no choice but to look behind him to see if there was somebody else the angel was talking to. Because Gideon was caught right in the midst of being a coward. He had harvested his wheat, and instead of threshing it in an open field where everybody could see him, he was threshing his field in a wine press. Amen. But Gideon hearkened unto the voice. And you see, so many of us, too many of us, see ourselves through the eyes of others what people have said about us, or sometimes through our own eyes. But how often do we look at ourselves through the eyes of God, our Creator? See, Gideon was seeing himself for what he was doing, but the angel of the Lord saw him and saluted him for what he would do. Amen? For what he was, what he had the potential to, to accomplish. And Gideon threw a question to the Lord, to the angel. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked at him and said unto him, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt serve Israel. From the hand of the Midianites have I not sent thee. And that's what the Lord is saying to you today. Go in this your might. Don't go in the knowledge of what you are doing now. Go in the knowledge of what God has said you will do. Amen? And so Gideon goes up against armies, not just one. Amen. Gideon takes 300 men. We know how he settled at 300. He started with 10,000. And God said, these are too many. If, you, if I give you victory with 10,000 men, you will think it was your men that brought the victory. He ended up with 300. 300 men. He was up against... 185,000 men. Okay. 300 
against 185,000. And they didn't fight a physical battle. God gave them a strategy. A strategy that caused the 185,000 to flee from before them without a single man being struck down. As you go through your walk, remember that we serve a supernatural God. Too often we forget that the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Too often we forget that when the children of Israel needed to get out of Egypt, God parted the Red Sea. When they needed to get into the Promised Land, God parted the Jordan. When they needed a victory, God was always there to give them a victory. Amen? I have a few. There's David. David was not his father's favorite. He was his father's youngest. But he was sent into the backside of the desert. Because his father thought he was an illegitimate son. Now, I'm not going to go into that today. So he was sent into the backside of the desert where the possibility of being killed by lions or bears existed. But right there in the backside of the desert, David found a deep relationship with God. Okay? And so when the bear came, David was not frightened. When the lion came, David was not frightened. And when the giant Goliath came, this is what he said. He said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? If David who was covered by the Old Testament, not like us, who are children of a new and better covenant. If David could bring down Goliaths, why can't you? What is that Goliath that has been standing against you in your life? You are more than able because Goliath has no covenant with the living God. So we need to wake up, church, to who we are. And even more than that, to whose we are. David. What about Israel, whose name was formerly Jacob? Right from his birth, or even before his birth, God had said to his mother, two nations are in your womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. What a prophecy. It was as if Esau, as he was coming out, Joseph, Jacob was trying to pull him back in, so he caught hold of his heel. But Esau was the elder of the two. But there was the hand of God upon Jacob. And Jacob went through many trials. And don't tell me that because you're a Christian, you won't have trials. As a matter of fact, some of the trials come because you're a Christian. Amen? Amen? But Jacob became Israel because he totally and completely submitted himself to God and said, if you don't bless me, you ain't going from here. Amen? So what about Jacob? 
or Israel. Consider him and how God had spoken to him by prophecy and they prophesied over you. People, the real prophets, the sincere prophets, not the telephone number ones. Okay. Who have spoken a word into your life. They are more, God is more than able to bring his word to pass concerning you. I look at Joseph. Joseph Alalade, the dreamer has come. Joseph the dreamer, who gave his brothers a dream God had given him, in which he was telling his brothers that I'm going to be bigger than you. Amen? He went from the place of favor with his father into the pit. He was thrown into a pit. And from the pit he was sold into slavery. From slavery he found himself in Potiphar's house. From Potiphar's house to prison. And all this time there was a dream over his life. There was a promise over his life. Yet he seemed to be going down and had not started going up. The time for you to go up will come. Nobody will stop it. When the time for you to go up comes, you will go up. Amen. From prison to pit, or from prison to, to prime minister, he became the second most important person in the nation of Egypt. And today we have an economic model that the world still practices from Joseph. Okay. And what did he tell his brothers when his brothers came to him and were afraid that after what they had done to him, Joseph was going to take revenge? He said, do you not know that for such a time like this did I go through all that I went through. I want you to summarize all your experiences. And sometimes you, bitterness may come to your heart because of the things that you have been through. But when you summarize all your experiences, I want you to focus on the fact that God will use them to take you into your place. Amen. He'll He's going to take you into the place that he has prepared for you. And there's no experience that is lost, whether it's a good experience or a bad experience. All things work together for the good of those, those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Our God is a good and an awesome God. Take another man. Elijah. All the Bible has to say about Elijah is Elijah the Tishbite. Whereas you look at others, it tells you he was the son of this and the son of that and, uh, and gives you their pedigree. Elijah had no pedigree. Maybe you're here and you can't really name your pedigree. Amen? Elijah had no pedigree. He was a Tishbite. That's all we know. But by the time Elijah started his ministry, when the king sent soldiers to capture him, this is what the Bible says Elijah said to them. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him with his fifty. Elijah could call fire from heaven, but he had no pedigree. Where God is taking you, you may not need to have a pedigree. 
Nobody may know where you have come from, but they know where you are going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I look at Esther. This is the last of the Old Testament ones I want to look at. Esther ended up in the palace of the king. And, and, and you know, understand this. God is the greatest orchestrator around. He orchestrated for a rebellious spirit to come upon Vashti, the queen. And she disobeyed her husband and therefore lost her place as queen. Now, if she knew that she would be dethroned, would she have disobeyed him? So she disobeyed her husband and, and made room for Esther to become queen. And God had only one purpose for Esther to become queen, and that was for Esther to deliver Israel. God is a great orchestrator. And even if you don't understand what is happening around you, know that your God is an orchestrator that can change things. He puts things, he puts things into position at the time when they need to go into position. Mordecai sent a message to them. For if thou holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be de destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for a time such as this? That was his word Mordecai's word to Esther. And, and, and you know, the interesting thing about the book of, of Esther is that God's name is not mentioned not even once. Yet he is behind every verse of that book because he is the unseen hand that is guiding the affairs of men. Hallelujah. And Esther is now encouraged by his word. And here's what she says. I will go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. She was ready to die for Jesus. Amen? I've just got a couple more watching my time. In the book of Matthew, we see God telling Peter. Now we've come to the, old, the New Testament say. We see God telling Peter, Thou art Peter. That's his name, Simon Peter. And upon this rock, he uses the word kephas, which is small rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. What he's telling Peter is the revelation of who I am is, is the rock upon which I will build my church. Revelation. Not Peter. You know, some people called God, God Peter and made him a pope because they thought Jesus was talking about building his church on Peter the man. Amen? But I'm not going to go into that now. He said, and then the very next moment, he's talking to Peter, and he has to tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So you see Peter, up today and down tomorrow. That was Peter's life. Okay? And then, one day, according to the, 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 the Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, this is what Jesus said to his disciples. Verily I say unto thee, there be some that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, hold that. And then after six days, he taketh with him Peter, Peter first, James, and John, and leadeth them on, up unto a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. Now connect these two verses. Jesus tells all his disciples that there are some amongst you that will not die until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Okay, And then he takes Peter, James and John the three into a high mountain the Mount of Transfiguration and is transfigured before them. Okay. That is Jesus demonstrating the coming of his kingdom with power. The Bible says his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, 
as no fuller on earth can white them. Now here's what Peter himself has to say about the experience. Peter, who was up today and down tomorrow, when he, when after Jesus had, had gone and he had taken up ministry, he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 18, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. That's fabu. Okay. When we made unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for received from God the Father the honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. See, Peter's life was himself transfigured. His life was changed, transformed by his experience with Jesus Christ. And you see, I cannot say this enough. Jesus will transform your life. If you hand your life over to Jesus, he will transform your life. Let me quickly close with this one. I have two more, but I'll try and finish it in one minute. But we have this treasure, says, treasure, says Paul. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So on the one hand, G Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He says we are troubled on every side. Okay? How many people know that Christians get troubled? We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. No matter how much trouble comes, it will not take you into distress in Jesus' name. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, you hear what he said? Troubled, not distressed. He, he goes through all the challenges that he's faced. And this is how he describes everything. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, our light affliction. So when he was shipwrecked, it was light affliction. When he was beaten by robbers, when he was robbed, when he was beaten, when he was flogged, when he went through all the things he went through, he described them as our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Listen, when you face trials, when you face trouble, call them a light affliction because they are there to work for you a far more exceeding weight of glory. Amen. The trouble is working. It's working if you will only allow it to have its way. I was going to talk about Stephen filled with the Holy Ghost and power, yet he was stoned to death. But while he was being stoned to death, he said, hey, brethren, see, I see Jesus Christ, not sitting on the right hand of majesty, but standing. Jesus stood because of what was happening to Stephen. Hallelujah. So, brethren, don't allow your faith to be shaken. Don't allow your faith to be shaken. Stand up in faith. Trust in Jesus. Thank you for watching today's sermon. Subscribe now to get an update on when the latest sermon arrives.